producing degrees that don't amount uh, to very much. My producer, Brian, he took a class in um, how to be a clown. <laughs> I think I know some senators who took that class. Um, nice, nice. Here to add some desperately needed legitimacy to this podcast and convince all of us we have the power to actually change this country for good, please welcome your congresswoman, Ayanna Presley. Hi, thank you for being here. Good to see you too. Thank you for being here. So uh, you were, of course, uh, uh, one of the lead co-sponsors of the Women's Health Protection Act, which... Uh, which did not pass. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what... Uh, you have to boo into the mic so that they know. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, what it's been like to kind of try to get that uh, in front of Congress and what the fight has been like just in the last few weeks since this opinion leaked? Well, hey, y'all. <laughs> yeah, well... You know, look, uh, I see someone here is wearing uh, one of the things that I live by, policy is my love language. And, you know, we've seen uh, policy enact great hurt and harm. And so I'm a, I'm a believer that if you can legislate hurt and harm, you can legislate equity, you can legislate healing, you can legislate justice. And so the Women's Health Protection Act, which by the way, uh, this is a bill that has been uh, reintroduced every Congress since 2013 by Congresswoman Judy Chu, and that is because we predicted that a day like this could come. And we were called hysterical. Um, and so uh, I'm a co-sponsor, co original uh, lead, a co-sponsor of the Women's Health Protection Act, which did pass the House. Now, uh, like so many other issues of consequence to everyone who calls this country home, from climate justice to uh, voting rights um, and so many other issues, uh, it's incredibly infuriating and demoralizing. And I think the Senate has contempt uh, for the American people, uh, certainly for, uh, for women, for birthing people. Um, you know, I can hardly move because I certainly feel as a black woman that they have their foot on my neck uh, and have for a very long time. And when I think about who will suffer the most? Because we know if you put safe legal abortion uh, out of reach for people, it doesn't mean that they'll stop having abortions. Abortion is health care, so it's a fundamental human right. But they will not do it safely. They will not do it legally. And again, as a black woman, um, when you consider the black maternal morbidity crisis and that black women are three times more likely to die in childbirth, and a history of medical apartheid on the bodies of black women and indigenous women uh, resulting in forced sterilizations and experimentation without our consent. And now a world where we could be experiencing forced birth, uh, by the way, in a country that still does not have universal childcare, paid leave, and in the middle of a formula shortage. So, you ask what it's been like. It's been um, infuriating. Uh, I'm outraged. It's frightening. And um, right now I'm just focused on doing everything that we can with uh, states and pushing governors. Uh, shout out to the Massachusetts State Legislature. We do have the Row Act here. Uh, but, I, but whether you live in Massachusetts or not, I want folks to know that Abortion, Roe v. Wade is still the law of the land. It is legal. If you have an abortion appointment, keep it. And uh, I want to thank the Massachusetts State Legislature for also just infusing uh, massive funds uh, recently to ensure that we'll have access to reproductive uh, care and health because we know there will be spillover uh, from other states if this ruling becomes final. And just an, a word about this Supreme Court. I mean, I hate to say I told you so. <laughs> Listen to women, y'all. So. Yeah. <laughs> there are 
these two fronts. One is doing everything we can right now to just protect access to healthcare, protect access to reproductive healthcare uh, across the country or getting people to where they need to go to get the care that they uh, should by right have, that they deserve. There's also the political fight uh, and doing everything we can to uh, make this November's election about uh, about healthcare, about access to abortion, about choice, about freedom as they're going after trans kids, if they're going after books, if they're going after teachers. Uh, one uh, uh, debate I've seen uh, uh, playing out since uh, the Senate failed to enshrine Roe is, all right, well now let's, let's put these Republicans on record again. Let's put them on the record saying whether or not they would enshrine a right to access to contraception. Let's put them on the record uh, on a right to uh, uh, marriage equality. Uh, what do you think about that as the next fight to just sort of go to, to uh, uh, narrow the scope of what we put up next and put Republicans on the record at a time when they are uh, banning, uh, basically banning IVF in certain states, uh, making passing these draconian laws that have no exception for, for rape and incest, passing these laws uh, that would uh, 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 not even protect uh, in the case of protect access in the case of the health or the life of the mother. What do you think about that as the next step to uh, try to get them on record for uh, these incredibly broadly popular uh, uh, nationally held views? Yeah, thank you for underscoring that point because Roe v. Wade is, uh, amongst majority of Americans, very popular. They do not want to see it overturned. So again, uh, this draft by the Supreme Court, if it becomes final, is a frightening bellwether of what could come and really strike at the heart of of privacy, um, everything from access to, to contraception, uh, to impacting who you marry, who you love. And so I think uh, the strategy that you're talking about, a, a more narrowed focus, is smart politically, because I do want Republicans to be put on the record so that the electorate can be put on notice and be very clear about who at every turn has demonstrated contempt for the American people. Um, we had a number of Republicans just this week who voted against baby formula. So, I mean, that's what we're dealing with. And again, as we talk about the, the ongoing fight here, so three things really quickly. One, please go to www.abortionfunds.org and, and, and support grassroots fundraising efforts for those who may you know, need to travel and need access to those funds. Secondly, I am taking up the fight uh, to ensure that medication abortion, which is an issue that I was leading on already, I chair the Abortion Rights and Access Task Force under the Pro-Choice Caucus. This is the first pro-choice majority Congress in the history of Congress. That's got to mean something. Um, and being in the majority has to be more than a talking point, which is why we have to keep pushing for these things. We want to ensure that medication abortion, uh, which is safe, um, continues to be accessible. Uh, we also want to make sure that access to contraception is not next on the, on the table. Representative Ocasio-Cortez and I uh, already had a bill on that front, which we'll, um, we're looking at you know, the timing of reintroducing that. And as I do think ultimately the, the best persuasion to the electorate for the midterms is impact. People have to be able to see and feel so tangibly, so clearly, that their government sees them and is uh, fighting and working on their behalf. And that is everything from canceling student debt to enshrining Roe v. Wade to making permanent the child tax credit um, and so many, and so many other issues. So, you know, I think that all of those things are both smart policy and also smart politics. Let's talk about canceling student debt. So, you, along with uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren and, and Chuck Schumer, you have a resolution urging President Biden to cancel fifty thousand. Uh, he's talked, I believe, up to like ten thousand. At least that's what they've signaled. Uh, what What is the status of that effort? When do we expect to hear a final word from the Biden administration? What, what's happening right now? Yeah, well, first I just want to acknowledge the strength of this movement. And this is an issue, student debt cancellation, one that uh, pundits, uh, electeds, many tried to really marginalize this issue. And there were a lot of false narratives. It was characterized as something regressive in impact that would only benefit white graduate students who went to affluent institutions. And so we've done a lot of effective work in rounding out this narrative to tell the truth of who is bearing the burden of this nearly $2 trillion crisis. 
Um, in my district, I have 76-year-olds on fixed incomes, collecting Social Security, still paying student debt. I have parents who are in their upper 60s, early 70s, who cannot retire because they took out Parent PLUS loans, and they're still paying on their kids' loans. It's an intergenerational issue. I have parents still paying on their loans, and now their kids' their kids' loans. And of course, we have a whole generation that can't um, start a family, grow a family, purchase a home, think about starting a business because of the burden of this debt. So we have done great work to diversify the narrative and tell the whole truth about who's bearing the burden of this. It's also a racial justice issue. Um, I, myself, like 85% of black student borrowers, had no choice but to take out loans. Our families were denied the ability to build generational wealth because of policy violence like redlining. We're also five times more likely to default. And there was a recent study that said 20 years after borrowers took out loans, black borrowers still owed 95% of their loan, and white borrowers owed 6%. So this is a racial justice issue, and that's why you see the NAACP stridently and affirmative in their support of student debt cancellation. We see the AFL-CIO, um, the American Federation of Teachers, the former Secretary of Education. Um, so the movement, we're closer than ever before. Um, that resolution had 100 members on it, including many from Democratic leadership. And we were successful in getting the president, the administration, to pause student loan payments during the pandemic three times. And that was, that's what I'm talking about. That was impactful, right? We're in the pandemic two plus years. People were able to use those monies that they saved to remain safely housed during this pandemic, to purchase essential goods. I even spoke to some people who became first generation home buyers. So if that's the sort of transformational impact that we're seeing in two years, imagine if the president uses that same authority for a broad-based student debt cancellation at $50,000. This is an economic justice issue. It's a racial justice issue. It is a gender justice issue because women bear two-thirds of this debt in this $2 trillion crisis. It's a racial justice issue, and economists have told us that if we cancel $50,000 broad-based student debt, that is going to um, alleviate the debt burden for 30 million people and close the racial wealth gap by 30%. So we are closer than ever before to getting this done. We need all of you to continue to just raise and amplify your voices, um, but we are closer than ever before to getting this done. And I, and I continue to, myself, Senator Warren, Leader Schumer, Rep. Omar, and others, to push for that broad-based student debt cancellation by executive action, $50,000. We've been talking about how challenging Congress is right now. This is a unilateral move. It doesn't require one vote. So just do it. <laughs> one, one question I have about it, even as somebody who thinks it's good politics and a good policy is, you know, there's getting this debt off the books and freeing up a lot of people mm -hmm. to sort of just live a better life and being able to be free to make better financial choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's also the fact of a broken system that allowed all that debt to accumulate in the first place, including uh, uh, colleges that, if not taking it, not just taking advantage of students, in some cases just being outright corrupt, the rising cost of these schools, the, the false promises schools have made uh, to young people about what they can do with these degrees. Uh, like if, the, you know, we cancel all this debt and the next day people start accruing more, what do we do to attack the problem at the source to make sure people have access to higher education that actually has value or that's ideally even free? Like what do we do to prevent the next round of debt cancellation? in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And, and that just uh, underscores the point that people are borrowing out of necessity. Um, and so, you know, I think it, 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 it's layered here. We have to have an intersectional approach. We have to address everything from 
you know, stagnant wages and rising costs. We have to address the policies that made it possible for the for-profit college industry to thrive with predatory marketing, deceptive business practices, producing degrees that don't amount uh, to very much. My producer, Brian, he took a class in um, how to be a clown. <laughs> I think I know some senators who took that class. Um, nice, nice. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, we have to address, you know, these things at, at the root, and that does mean investing in education is the public good that it is. Federally, we need to do that. That means, um, you know, expansion of Pell Grants. That means tuition-free college. It means, finally, uh, investing in our historically black colleges and universities who have been chronically and woefully underfunded, which is exactly why you have seen HBCU presidents during this pandemic use ARPA funds to cancel student debt because this is a racial justice issue. I mean, out of all the ways that they could have spent those funds, that's where they decided to, to spend it. So again, this is transformational, meaningful, impactful policy, but it is just one bold step in the right direction because we have to address those other issues which I, I just enumerated. Uh, what would you think if we did everything that you're talking about, but not for MBA students? That if they just went, if they went to business school or law school, just it's not going to apply to business school or law school. I think it'd be cool. You don't have to comment. No. Don't comment. But I don't want it to. I, if you went to business school, I don't want to forgive your debt. Uh, Shut. <laughs> Anyone who has debt deserves relief. It's a $2 trillion crisis. I mean, come on. They go to cocktail parties and then go work for, for <laughs> Goldman. No. Uh, all right. Sorry. All right. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. But oh, so uh, before we here. let you go. I love your skirt. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we let you go, uh, when we have someone of, of, of seriousness, of stature here, we like to play a game we call Queen for a Day. Just a day? That's all you get. Here you get a dang. I wish it were longer. <laughs> okay. Are you ready? Uh, I think so. You're walking down Tremont Street and you see Ben Affleck struggling to carry an impossible number of Dunkin' iced coffees. Do you help him or do you take a picture? <laughs> I help him and then I ask, where's Jennifer? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Team Jennifer, hardcore. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> You're in a congressional hearing room and you find a forgotten folder of classified documents that prove that aliens have landed on Earth and the government knows all about it. Do you blow the whistle? Mm. I know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be a whistleblower. I, I, would, I would just get it probably to Adam Schiff or something. Yeah, let's get it to Schiff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get Chip on the blower. We got the evidence. <laughs> Next question. Okay. How many Taco Bell Mexican pizzas in one week is too many? Have you had a Taco Bell Mexican pizza? Y'all know. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm not in the Taco Bell. Now, you could ask me that about a McDonald's Happy Meal, which I do occasionally you know, partake. It's a good, yeah, it's good. It has a toy. Yeah, apple pie. Little apple pie. See, they, 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 you yeah. can get them with fruit now, but <laughs> we don't want the fruit we now. We don't want it, it's true. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when I go to McDonald's, I get a 10-piece chicken nuggets meal, and then I also get one little cheeseburger. Okay. And that's the true aficionado. You get a meal and one little thing. Okay. Do you do that? Uh, no. Have you ever had a Taco Bell Mexican pizza? I have. You can just say, you haven't. I no. don't think you have. No. <gasps> um, well, I, I we haven't. can talk about it. We yeah. can maybe try it later. Should I? Yeah. They're good. Um, they don't even pay us. <laughs> Who said no? You joyless fucks. <laughs> Here's the thing about the Taco Bell Mexican pizza. <laughs> oh my goodness. Here's the thing about it. This it's is, not Mexican. This is serious. And it's not a pizza. It's really neither, but, you don't care. but I don't care. You don't care. It's delicious. It's delicious. Okay. Next question. Do you have a farewell message for Madison Cawthorn? Come on. 
I'm going to keep it cute and mute. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> uh, okay, next question. How guilty do I have to feel about using plastic straws at every opportunity? Mm. But keep in mind, mm. I have an electric car. Guilty. Guilty. You got to feel guilty. Guilty. Yeah. Uh, final question. As someone originally from Chicago, what is one way you would change Chicago to be more like Boston? <laughs> Screen for a day. It's no joke. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, yeah, they would, they would have had fared better in the playoffs, you know? Ooh. So, uh, you know... So, but one way I will say, I don't want to get in trouble with my people, but I do want to say that one thing that Boston can learn from Chicago is we need to grill the hot dogs here. I, I just want to say that. What a boiled hot dog. We need to grill our hot dogs. You should grill a hot dog. You should grill a hot dog. A little celery salt. Relish. Little, your relish? Yeah, that's a Chicago hot dog. Do you like brown mustard or, or yellow mustard? Yellow. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And yet here we are having a conversation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much to Congressman Ayanna Presley. Thank, Thank you. you for being Thank here. You. And if you want to help make an impact, go to votesaveamerica.com slash row. You can donate to the funds uh, that the Congresswoman was talking about. There are ways to help right now. Thank you so much. Now it's time for a segment we call Hot Takes. You know how it works. Each of us will have one minute where we're forced to defend a never-before-seen indefensible position, and we each get one skip. But if you use uh -oh. your skip, beware, our producers are cruel people. And we don't know what the next one will be, all right? It says here that I am up first. Let's see what my hot take is. Sure, Facebook and Twitter are bad, but TikTok is worst of all. Uh, could not agree more. Let me give me one minute. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Do you ever see the movie Broadcast News? All right? The devil isn't going to have hooves, all right? Like Facebook or Twitter, all right? You look at Facebook and Twitter, you know you're dealing with a monster, right? You're dealing with something that makes you feel bad inside, that it makes you feel like, um, you know, like everyone's living a better life and everyone's angry and society's collapsing all around you. Not on TikTok. TikTok sucks you in because you're like, is this a house inspector explaining to me how flipped houses have crappy built-in uh, sinks? Is this a, a, a Lizzo dance that I now know? But it sucks you in and it slowly rots your brain. And then the next thing you know, you spent 40 minutes on the toilet watching TikToks. <laughs> next thing you know, you're abandoning your friendships and your relationships. You're bringing up TikTok at dinner parties with adults who think you sound ridiculous. And then all of a sudden you realize you're 39 years old. Do you know what comes after that? Nothing. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Next up, it's Pat. Oh my God. Sleep is unimportant and I don't need it. Wow, this is really, really true. As someone who was chronically addicted to the amazing drug speed, I can vouch that <laughs> I could vouch that you could be really, really happy for about three hours and then not sleep for truly five days. And you can live, and you can live, and that's you can't do that with other things that are essential, like water or food. Um, you know, sleep, it's really, and listen, I think that we are in a gig economy, applause, applause. And I think that we have to be always booking. It's booking, you know what's not essential is sleep. You know what is essential is booking work. We need to be booking roles in TV and film. Everyone should be doing that every single day. And if you're not, then um, what are you even doing here in a city? This is a city, it is. And, um, <laughs> And yeah, sleep is, <laughs> sleep is just like, you can get sleep, you know, when you're dead, a famous truism that, you know, sometimes truisms, what they say about truisms is they're actually really true. And um, that is basically my biggest um, argument. If you take one thing from this show, it's that truisms are actually really true. Let's see what's up next. I get very frustrated when the media doesn't give equal airtime to every point of view. Eugene, Eugene, that's your position. Sure. I get very frustrated when the media does not give equal airtime to, ev to every point of view. So every single point of view, like sometimes you'll see two or three points of view and you're like, there's gotta be more. 
There's got to be like, uh, it's like a multiverse of possibilities where you could have, like you could be like, uh, murder is bad, murder is good, but then there's a lot of grays. Murder's weird. Murder smells like sulfur. M mur <laughs> murder, murder's like too much like bananas. And sometimes you're watching TV and they're, I'm making a point, I'm making a point, 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 point. Are you angry, 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 point, point, point. And then you're like, but there's so many more takes. Please give each equal time to each take uh, TV. <laughs> nice. Nice take. Let's see what's next. Drag is easy and anyone could do it. That's Lady Bunny's take. You have one minute. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> oh, you fucking bitch. You absolutely un fucking real. What? That's the good thing about a caftan. It hides a multitude of sins. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, but, but, wow. Wow. But, Thought we were going to have a nice time. Oh, we did have a nice time. So, I mean, drag... Did I say that? <laughs> drag is easy. I mean, I'm sitting here with my nuts shoved up my ass and support hose, and I'm saying, when did I say that? Maybe when I didn't need the girdle and all that. So, um, wow. I mean, maybe I should have said, bad drag is easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fired. You, I'm so fired. I think you're going to have a nice time. Feeling pretty confident. You psych yourself out. You go out on stage. Next thing you know, Lady Bunny's tearing you down. Let's, <laughs> let's see what's next. Shut up, Lizzo. We get it. No, I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing this again. I took too much shit for the Dolly Parton one. Next. There's absolutely nothing gay about Top Gun. That I can do. There is nothing gay about Top Gun, and let me tell you why. Uh, there was a time before, you know, everybody got all politically correct, when it was understood that heterosexual men could get shirtless and bump uglies uh, and play volleyball and kiss, and it wasn't a big gay thing, it was just something you did at boarding school. And then we decided that being gay was like an identity. And then all these straight guys were like, well, we better not act gay because then we'll be gay. But we're not gay. We're straight. We're hot, straight guys who have a real antagonism that isn't sexual at all. Val Kilmer and Tom Cruise do not have chemistry in a homosexual sense. They have another kind of tension. Heterosexual, heterosexual male on male, abs-based bro ten tension and that's what Top Gun is. Thank you. Let's see what's next. Track and field, especially the middle distance events, is too boring for air and shouldn't be allowed in the Olympics. Um, yeah, track and field, especially the middle distance events, is too boring for air and should not be televised. Even the Olympics, I think I remember that correctly. And um, yeah, you know, it's just running, guys. It's just running. Why? Just because these people devote their entire lives to training and very specific skills. And just because it's this very simple skill that, like, that that people try to master for their whole lives just to just to just to be able to do really well doesn't mean that we need to watch it on TV. I mean, for one, let's say uh, the outfits are a little bit slutty, and um, I just don't think that people should be trouncing around an oval in in such honestly revealing things. And um, and I thought that you know maybe you know there should be some more story. Have you ever heard of storytelling, guys? Do you guys know about storytelling? Yeah, there's not that in track and field, okay? And so get it off my screen. I don't want to see this track on my TV, Tyra Banks. And um, yeah, track is really boring. It's just running and no, actually this is really true. No one who's ever run has any personality. <laughs> nice. Let's see what's next. Animated movies and television are strictly for te children. Eugene, that's for you. So animated movies are, uh, and, and television are strictly for children. Adults uh, shouldn't watch them, and if they walk into a room and see 
it, it's not geared for them. They should hide. They should run away. Um, children should absorb it and learn from it, and that should be their schooling. And adults should look away and not even know what the children are watching or doing, because that is the, the separation of the two is the best way to raise a society. Um, and, uh, oh, okay, here's some more talking. Um, <laughs> So it will, uh, it poisons an adult mind. Uh, children can handle unusual things, but adults are so rigid, they cannot see anything weird. And if they do, they might eat poison. They might go into the kitchen under the sink and eat whatever is there. So they should not watch television that is animated movies or television. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Let's see what our next hot take is. Whenever someone asks me what my favorite place in New York City is, I say Times Square and I mean it. That's something that's your position. You can also pass and see what's next, but you have to defend this. You, Times Square is your favorite place in New York, right? Now, honey, you must have gotten that off of my space because I have not said Times Square is so cleaned up now that there are no more fucking drug dealers or $20 hustlers. I mean, there are literally, like you walk by them now and they're like, I got Louis Vuitton, I got, I got Chanel. And it used to be like, I've got crack. Go and Times Square is a fucking bus now. It's a, this, but it used to be fun. I'm sorry, was that not... I'm, listen, I'm not very politically correct either. No, In this fact, is I'm good. So, we are so politically correct now that they are trying to make Dick Van Dyke change his name to Penis Van Lesbian. I mean, <laughs> it has just gotten out of control. It's out of control. And I say that as a member of the LGBT LMNOP community. And my pronouns, by the way, are slutty and sugar tits. <laughs> my sexual preference is often, and I identify <laughs> as trans slender because I used to be, now I'm trans fats. <laughs> Phenomenal. A plus, 10 out of 10. Let's do, let's do one more. Bring back Mel Gibson. Bring back Mel Gibson. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Sure, he's made mistake after mistake after mistake, revealing his inner truth, not something that happened by accident in a few instances, but actually over time revealed through his work and his actions and his behaviors to be the core of who he is. Put that aside. I live in a, I am a Mel Gibson Hamlet in a Kenneth Branagh Hamlet world. That is very specific. Here's the thing, Mel Gibson is an anti-Semite, and I hate that about him. But, but, Jesus, but we don't make leading men with those crazy eyes anymore. They all have, their skin is all too good, they're all too ripped. Chris Evans, his life is looking like Chris Evans. Mel Gibson looks like he woke up as the character from Lethal Weapon. I miss that. And, I, and you know what else? I, how bad could you be if Jodie Foster is your emergency contact? <laughs> Pretty bad. <laughs> you made me do that. What are you giving me the X for? You wrote that thing. God damn it. And that's hot takes. Thank you so much to Lady Bunny, to Eugene Merman, to Pat Regan. That was so, so funny. Thank you so much. 